Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to Biomond Live. Thank you ever so much for joining us this evening. And it is amazing to see so many of you here. The numbers are shooting up rapidly. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in at home. Um, now, my name's Rebecca. I'm the Customer Support Manager here at Biomond, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, just to introduce our wonderful guest speaker, Dr. Leanne Atkin, who is going to be presenting for you. So um, before we formally start the webinar, everybody, um, I'm just going to run through a few quick housekeeping points uh, just to make sure that the webinar goes as smoothly as possible for you. So tonight's session is all about peripheral arterial disease. Uh, Leanne is going to be talking to you about the assessment, uh, diagnosis, and also um, the role in which larval therapy, larval therapy excuse me, <laughs> can play um, in the treatment for um, PAD. Now, tonight's session is going to be, um, it'll last around about an hour, um, but that time frame may vary, so do uh, sit tight, bear with us, um, and we will set aside some time uh, just at the end for any questions that you may have for uh, Leanne. Now, I can see absolutely loads of you are saying hello in the chat. It's wonderful to see. Um, feel free to introduce yourselves and um, let us know who you are and where you're watching from this evening. And do feel free as well to, net to network amongst yourselves. Um, now, as I've said, for any questions that you may have for Leanne as, as we go through the presentation and the session for you this evening, um, you can get those across to Leanne just by typing in the Q&A um, button on Zoom. And both the chat and the Q&A button can be found just at the bottom of your screens. So Leanne, as I've said, is very kindly joining us this evening to present for you on peripheral arterial disease. Um, Dr. Leanne Atkin is a vascular nurse consultant and she works under the Mid-Yorkshire NHS Trust. Now, what's Leanne going to be talking to you about this evening? Well, Leanne is going to be presenting on the anatomy of lower legs. Um, she's also going to be discussing what peripheral arterial disease is, who's at risk of it and why. Leanne is then also going to be chatting to you about the importance of individual assessments, the ways in which PAD can be treated, and also how timely wound bed preparation is key in patient post-arterial intervention. And at the end, we are also going to be looking at the role of larval therapy in patients with PAD. So everyone, that's it from me for now. Leanne, I'm gonna ask you to join me on screen if that's okay. And when you're comfortable, you can share your screen. So let me just stop sharing mine. Bear with me a second. The joys of technology. <laughs> and I'll ask you to now kindly share your screen, please, Leanne. And when you're comfortable, you can start your presentation. Brilliant, just checking you can see my screen. Lovely. Yes, we can see it. That's perfect. Fantastic. Thanks, Leanne. So good evening, everybody. Um, as been introduced, my name is Leanne Atkin. I'm a vascular nurse consultant and a research fellow. I work within Yorkshire and I'm sure some of you can recognise my accent. Um, I just want to say welcome to you all. Good grief, what a varied bunch we've got. I think we've got people from all around the world. I've seen New Zealand and Netherlands, so hello. Um, I've also seen we've got people from students right to vascular nurse specialists. Um, so hopefully you'll all take something away from this. Please, please, though, ask questions throughout. If anything's not clear, just pop it in the questions box. There is no such thing as a stupid question. There is only ignorance. So hopefully um, you'll all be, we'll all be interacting with this together. So as said that this session is really going to give you a whistle stop tour about peripheral arterial disease. It's going to talk about that assessment, that diagnosis and the role of larval therapy in patients with peripheral arterial disease. So let's start at the very beginning, let's say. So, so what is peripheral arterial disease? Well, peripheral arterial disease is simply the abnormal narrowing of any arteries except the arteries to the brain or the heart. If it's the brain or the heart, it's called something different, coronary disease or, or um, carotid disease. If it's anywhere else in the body, we call it peripheral arterial disease. You will most know it because peripheral arterial disease most commonly affects patients on their lower limbs. But the thing that you have to remember is that peripheral arterial disease is a marker 
of advanced systemic sclerosis, uh, atherosclerosis. So in other words, if you've got one area of atherosclerosis, at the end of the day, they're all pipes that connect together, you're very likely to get other areas in other arteries. Peripheral arterial disease is a disease that mostly affects over the age of 60. You can see the prevalence here within this graph. It jumps from 60 to 70. And then once you get over 80, the prevalence is about 27% in men and about 21% in women. Um, the rates of women are slightly lower than men. We think that's something to do with those pesky female sex hormones sort of just give you a little bit of prevention in terms of that disease formation. So when we talk about peripheral arterial disease, it's important to start off to talk about who is at risk. So if you look at this um, graph here, this is a forest plot. If you can imagine the line in the middle, if it, it is, is the, the um, line of no difference, the further to the right that horizontal line is, the bigger the difference. If it crosses the central line, the less chance it is of making a difference. So the biggest risk factor we have for patients who develop peripheral arterial disease, by far none, is diabetes. Secondly, becomes smoking, then hypertension, and then high cholesterol. And you can see if you do come across patients with diabetes who are smokers and high blood pressure, you can see why they often run into significant problems. There are other risk factors, though, slightly softer risk factors in terms of if a patient's had previous um, TIAs, strokes, MIs, angios, uh, sorry, uh, angina, then they have already got cardiovascular disease. If you've got a history of cardiovascular disease, because this disease is throughout the system, you're much more likely to get that disease in your lower limbs too. We've talked about the age. There is some increase in terms of certain ethnic groups, and there's certainly links within the genetic family line. But the ones that you need to be mostly wary of is the smoking, the hypertension, and diabetes. What happens when you get peripheral arterial disease is it starts off to form something called atheroma. Atheroma is a collection of cells and lipids really in that middle layer of the artery, the medial layer that you can see on that diagram. Those cells start to actually ingest, so think of those like Pac-Man, they start to eat the lipids, the fat within there, and therefore they start to blow up like foam cells are called. Think of, of um, the marshmallow man uh, off Ghostbusters. They start to grow so much and then finally they pop and what they leave behind is a pool of dead lipids and that fat then starts to form and starts to um, become more cohesive and therefore starts to affect not only the medial layer of the artery but also the inner layer of the artery. And once it starts to affect that inner layer of the artery, that's where we start to get atherosclerosis, changes of that actual wall lining of the artery. The, artery, the, the, the disease can start to protrude into the artery, starting to narrow the artery. We call that stenosis within the artery, that narrowing. And it's really interesting that up to 70% of narrowing with an artery can be completely and utterly asymptomatic. It's only when you get a significant narrowing over 70% where clinical symptoms may start to occur. What happens is once the um, atheroma starts to be formed, it can start to um, cause a very hard um, topping, if you like, on the top of this. And what that happens is it sends off a chronic inflammatory response and very easily you can get activation of the red blood cells. So therefore they start to clot around that area of disease and around that area of narrowing of the artery. And quite often you can have little clots forming like on that bottom picture that flies off onto the artery. And that's mostly the pathophysiology that causes TIA. You get carotid disease, you get turbulent flow, platelet plugging, activation of those red blood cells that then flies off, occludes one of the um, 
cerebral arteries and therefore causes that trans ischemic attack. It's the same as a patient if they have an MI. We have that disease, it flies off a clot and it causes ischemia to one of the muscles within the heart. So when we talk about atherosclerosis, we, we can talk about things like primary events and secondary events. We can talk about things called acute events and chronic events. But let's make it a little bit simple for this talk. Today, we are talking about atherosclerosis in the lower legs. Predominantly, you get a narrowing of the artery. You don't often get that embolization that comes following it. We know that the artery over time changes substantially. Once atheroma starts to deposit, it starts to affect every action of the artery. We start to get hemodynamic changes. We get microvascular changes, the big blood vessels, but it also starts to affect the microvascular system and we get tissue remodeling. We get this constant cycle of inflammation that causes problems with that endothelial lining and therefore perpetuates this problem going forward. So that's what peripheral arterial disease is. It's that atheroma causing the atherosclerosis. So just some general headline facts for you really. Peripheral arterial disease is prevalent in 10 to 25% of the population over 55 throughout the globe. But the one thing to remember with that is that 70 to 80 percent of them are asymptomatic. The disease will be there in the artery. They're already showing systemic disease, but it's simply not at a level that's causing them any problems. That's important when we start to talk about the management of the overall patient in terms of their cardiovascular risk. And the importance of the cardiovascular risk is that if a patient who's got peripheral arterial disease has the same relative risk of death of those who's had a heart attack or a stroke. So if, if you have a patient or if one of your family members, God forbid, had a heart attack or a stroke, the first thing that they'd be saying is, am I going to have another event? Am I going to die early from this? Patients with peripheral arterial disease do not see that um, connection. A patient with peripheral arterial disease asks, am I going to lose my leg? But they never actually ask, am I going to die young? And unfortunately, we know that peripheral arterial disease, if you've got a diagnosis, you've got a four times increase of dying within the next 10 years compared to somebody without peripheral arterial disease. And because of all of this, actually, patients' management with peripheral arterial disease, we must think about stopping that secondary disease formation. They don't die of their legs, they die of heart attacks and strokes. We have to focus our management on that secondary disease formation. And we look when you look at the totality of the, of the mortality rates over five years, if you look at that graph at the bottom, look what happens if you get a diagnostic of PAD. You're up there, really. There's only lung cancer and pancreatic cancer that kills you of a greater risk than peripheral arterial disease. It's significant. So we must manage those cardiovascular risk factors. We must manage that patient with best medical therapy. So you've all joined tonight because you are passionate lower limb clinicians. I can imagine many of you treat patients on a regular basis with peripheral arterial disease. You'll be managing leg conditions of severity in your everyday practice. So if I asked you to label this diagram, would you be able to do it? I think some of you would be sitting in the audience going, good grief, no. Well, actually, I'll challenge you that you should be able to label this diagram. These are the major arteries that, that speed the blood supply to the lower leg. And if you are working with patients with peripheral arterial disease, I believe that you should know these structures. So the major blood vessel that comes off the heart is called the aorta. Arteries are fantastic. They only ever bifurcate into two. They never split into three. The first bifurcation as it comes down and splits into your legs is called the common iliac artery. That then splits again into the internal iliac artery that feeds the pelvis and the external iliac artery that runs down the leg. As it gets to the level of the hip, 
the profunda femoris comes off that feeds the lateral aspect of that thigh. The superficial femoral artery runs all the way down to just at the adductor canal nearish your knee where it turns into the popliteal artery. As it goes down, the first artery that comes off is your anterior tibial that forms that dosurgis pedis at the foot. The next one that comes off is the perineal that goes right down the middle of the artery that, that filters out about the level of the malleolus. And the final one that goes down the medial aspect is the posterior tibial artery that runs behind that malleolus. You will know those distal arteries that I've mentioned, but I urge you all just to get familiar with the other arteries. If you're gonna get letters from vascular surgeons or vascular clinicians, they'll often talk about these arteries. Sometimes though we group them. Sometimes we call them the inflow, which includes the aorta, iliac, and sometimes we call it the crural vessels, which includes the anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and perineal. So if you hear those terminologies, inflow is the, is the groiny bit, crural vessels is the below the knee bit. And hopefully that will start for vascular letters to make a little bit more sense when you get them about your patients. Arteries are fantastic things. Um, the fantastic things, because you've got to remember an artery carries the blood pressure. So if you think that you have a blood pressure, if you are if you're well controlled, or if you've got normal blood pressure around 140 millimeters of mercury, that's a big pressure within that artery. And arteries don't often dilate. They can do, but rarely. Most times the arteries control that pressure within them. And they do that because the middle layer is made up of connective tissues and smooth muscle fibers with a degree of elasticity. So they're able to hold that pressure and cope with that pressure inside. The major, obviously, um, function of the artery is to transport that oxygenated blood from the heart down to your toes. I just want to remind you, though, that we don't have a closed system. Some people think that if you've got problems with the arteries, you might get problems with the backflow going up the veins. It's not a closed system. They run next door to each other, but they're not directly connected in such a way. They're connected by that capillary bed. And that capillary bed is a very, very detailed and intricate thing. So you can see within this, you can see at the point where gaseous exchange takes place in terms of that oxygen gets pushed out to those surrounding tissues. You can see all the green vessels, they're the lymphatic channels, and you can see the intricate nature of that. So it's unsurprising that when you think about this, we can often have problems if you've got problems with venous disease, you will get back pressure into that capillary bed. Therefore, you get leaking of the blood products. You get plasma causing edema, red blood cells causing the hemosiderin staining, white blood cells causing that chronic inflammation. From the artery point of view, if you've got problems with arterial insufficiency, the one thing that happens in the capillary bed is you get maximum vasodilation. And really one of those little tiny arteries start to expand and therefore, once again, you can get leakage of blood products into the surrounding tissue. Most commonly is plasma. So many patients who've got significant peripheral arterial disease can also have mild edema at the same time. So I wanted to show you those slides because I'm a real believer that you've got to understand the anatomy and physiology to be able to build on the pathophysiology that comes next. So if a patient has got problems with peripheral arterial disease, they're only gonna present really in three ways. Remember that a lot of the patients are asymptomatic, they have the disease, they are at risk where they're just not presenting any complaints. But the first patient symptoms patients often complain of is intermittent claudication. That can progress to tissue at rest pain and it can progress to tissue loss. You may be questioning why I've got a picture of a Greek or a Roman god. My history is not very good, but I can tell you that that's I Claudius and he had a limp. And that's where the word intermittent claudication comes from. It's simply Latin for the word to limp. Intermittent claudication, I think, is dead easy 
to diagnose. It's just about listening to your patient's symptoms. So patients will classically describe reproducible pain on exercise, which is relieved by rest. It never experiences at rest. So patients will often say to you, I can walk 200 yards without a problem. Then I get a terrible vicey type cramp pain at the back of my leg. It makes me stop because I feel like I'm gonna fall over. When I stop for a minute or two, the need for oxygen in blood reduces. I can start walking again. I reach that 200 yard point and poof, the pain comes back. And that pain is simply because the oxygen demand increases during periods of exercise. That narrowed artery can't give it the blood supply that's required. So the muscle starts to um, respirate anaerobically. Therefore, you get an increase of lactic acid and then you get that leg pain. The claudication is often affected within the major muscle group. So most commonly the calf but can occur in the thigh and also can occur in the buttock. And the location of the disease is a direct equivalent to the level, uh, the location of the pain is a direct equivalent to the level of the disease. So if you've got pain in your calf, it's probably coming from your superficial femoral artery. If you've got pain in your thigh, it's probably coming from, from your common femoral artery. If you've got pain in your buttocks, it's probably coming from your inflow, your aortoiliac area. As much as intermittent claudication doesn't um, often progress to any further symptoms, it can significantly impact patients' quality of life. Um, and I think that sometimes the patients that tell me that they've waited all their life to retire and now they can only walk 150 yards without significant pain, I really feel for the impact that that's having on their quality of life. But from our point of view, the thing that we need to concentrate on is not the leg. If you look at the progression of the natural history of a patient with peripheral arterial disease, if you look at that limb morbidity. 70 to 80 percent of patients with claudication will just be stable. They will stay as they are. 10 to 20 percent though will have worsening claudication, but only one to two percent slip over into that critical limb ischemia, that rest pain and tissue loss. So 99 percent of patients with claudication stays, um, is, their limbs are not threatened. But look at the other side in terms of the cardiovascular risks. 20% of them will have had a non-fatal cardiovascular risk, up to 30% of them will die, and the majority of those patients will die because of a cardiovascular cause. And that's why when we see patients with claudication, actually what we need to concentrate on is preserving their life. And when we talk about preserving life, we talk about something called best medical therapy. The best medical therapy at this moment in time is in the UK is clopidogrel 75 milligrams and atorvastatin 80 milligrams. There is some movement within the literature. It's not supported by NICE at this moment in time to use what's classically called the COMPASS regime which is rivaroxaban 2.5 plus aspirin of either 75 or 100 milligrams. But the nice recommendation is any patient with peripheral arterial disease, no matter what their cholesterol is, they should be on 80 milligrams of atorvastatin and 75 milligrams of clopidogrel. We know that this combination of medication helps to reduce their overall risk of heart attacks and strokes. It helps to preserve their life. We also need to look at that modifiable risk factors. We need to control their HbA1c. We need to ensure we've got good blood pressure control. We need them to stop smoking. We need them to increase their level of exercise to maintain a healthy weight. We need to think about any of those modifiable risks that we can make a difference in their long-term outcomes. But in terms of their leg and how we treat intermittent claudication, the treatment should be structured exercise. It should be structured exercise, but I can tell you it's highly, it's very um, varied across the UK within Yorkshire. There's only one provision of super, uh, structured exercise across the whole of the patch of Yorkshire and Yorkshire's massive. Um, 
There is issues in terms of the commissioning of this and also there is issues in terms of patients staying the course for supervised exercise. But many of you, especially if you're podiatrists out there, you will have recognised a patient's got claudication. You would have said, like this picture here, that you can't feel a pulse behind the knee. The ABPI is reduced and you think they've got occlusive disease in their superficial femoral artery. You send them to vascular and we go, yes, that's all right. That's exactly spot on. You've got it correct. But we do nothing to them. We send them straight away. And you may be thinking, hang on. But what about the risk to the limb? The risk to the limb is less than 1%. And the reason why that is, is that the human body is amazing. If I tied off your artery in your thigh now, you would have induced ischemia. But arteries with atheroma don't tie off overnight. They slowly and slowly start to reduce their size and caliber. And therefore, the body has time to respond. And the body responds by growing these collateral vessels, this angiogenesis. And if you trace them around, it's like its own natural bypass. These are actually stimulated by nitric oxide, which comes on with the pain and the anaerobic um, respiration of the muscle. It produces nitric oxide, which stimulates VEGF, the, the, uh, the growth factor to be able to grow arteries. So many patients with peripheral arterial disease, we won't treat their arterial disease. We will treat their risk factors, we'll put them on best medical therapy, and we hope we hold them there. Only 1% of that peripheral arterial disease population go on to the next stage. And the next stage is chronic limb-threatening ischemia. You'll have heard a change in terminology over the last 12 months. We used to call it critical limb ischemia, and now we're calling it chronic limb-threatening ischemia. Chronic limb-threatening ischemia is the start of symptoms in its whole totality, if you like, and critical limb ischemia is the end bit of those symptoms. So such as this patient, he's starting to experience arterial rest pain. This is a sign of chronic limb-threatening ischemia. Arterial rest pain is, again, I think relatively easy to spot. Patients will say that they're in absolute agony. As soon as they go to bed on a night time, they elevate their leg, the pain wakes them up, it's that bad. The pain is relieved by hanging the leg out the side of the bed. It occurs every single night. There's a degree of background of constant pain and the pain is so severe, patients say to me, they feel like taking off their own leg. This is, um, if you can see that picture, you can see towards the end of that foot, the foot is looking pinker compared to the rest of the skin. Many people misdiagnose that as patients having a degree of infection. Actually, that's normal arterial flushing. And the way to decide whether it's actually redness through flushing or redness through infection is simply lift that limb up to the height of the hip. If you lift it up to the height of the hip, the colour will drain away, you know that that's flushing. Infection would stay the same pinkness wherever you put it. If you get arterial flushing that disappears on elevation, we call that a positive Burgess sign. It is a classic sign of chronic limb-threatening ischemia. The thing is with these patients is they do need referring to vascular services on an urgent basis. Not on an emergency basis as in today, but certainly they need to be seen within the next three to four days within a vascular service, because this is a sign that this, the cells are not coping with the amount of perfusion they've got. And if we don't revascularize this patient soon, what happens next is they start to tip over into arterial ulceration. When you start to get arterial ulceration, it really can occur on two places. It can occur on the leg or more commonly on the foot. Arterial ulcers on the leg, I still think are relatively uncommon. If you do find them though, they look classic just like this. You can see that the skin is shiny. The hairs just simply haven't got the nutrition to be able to keep growing. You can see that the ulcer is round, punched out the toenails are thickened, and you've got that local edema that's making the skin all shiny. That patient will have significant pain on that leg. 
but those ulcers on the legs are relatively rare. The more common ones are the ones that you see at the top. So at the top, that if you look at that great toe, that's often how peripheral arterial disease starts to present. It presents that purple mottling. It slowly fixes to go to that, that second toe. And finally, it can be fixed like that third toe where you've got established gangrene. And if we don't do something about that soon, we can have progression of symptoms so much so that we're in a position where patients end up losing their limb because they've got ischemia that's irresolvable and a non-functioning foot, just like that picture at the bottom. But there's a lot we can do to prevent that from happening. It's about recognition of peripheral arterial disease, recognition of urgency of symptoms. So, and this is where you guys come in. I want you to be very confident in being able to take a history from a patient with peripheral arterial disease, for you to be able to recognize those symptoms, to be able to consider the urgency of what you need to do. Patients still are presenting much later than what we need them to in arterial centers. And often we find that it's too late to do limb salvage. So what we need from you is a comprehensive history. We need you to be listening for those signs and symptoms of arterial disease. And hopefully I've given you some hints and tips of how to recognize intermittent claudication and arterial rest pain. But we want you to be comfortable foot pal pulse palpation. Doppler assessment including waveforms. Consider using ABPIs for resting and exercise and consider doing toe pressures. So let's take all them one by one. The first thing that I'd like you to do is to get comfortable at palpating peripheral pulses. And I don't just mean foot pulses. There is a pulse in the groin called the femoral pulse. You can find it directly over that green line that's on that image. It's relatively easy to feel. I encourage you all, if you're an examining knee and patient with peripheral arterial disease, examine that femoral pulse. There's also a pulse in the popliteal fossa called the popliteal pulse. The thing is with that is to make sure the patient fully relaxes the leg, allow them, allow you in you to take the weight of the leg and lifting it up high, just like in that picture. That helps to force the popliteal artery onto your fingers, making it a little bit easier for you to feel. I appreciate if you're a generalist nurse and I've just asked you to feel a groin pulse or a popliteal pulse, I know that I'm actually challenging you. But what you will be good at is feeling of the foot pulses. Feeling of the foot pulse of the dorsalis pedis. Remember where to find that. It's in between the first and the second tendon that you can see. Draw a line up the tendon midfoot. You should be able to feel a pulse. The, uh, the posterior tibialis artery, you find it by hooking your fingers around the back of the malleolus, and that's where you will locate the pulse. If you can feel a pulse, it's a good indication that the peripheral arterial disease is not significant. But I understand that actually pulse palpation can be subjective. And that's why we ask many of you to actually undertake an ankle brachial pressure index. It's simply a blood pressure of the leg. It compares the systolic blood pressure of the heart, sorry, of the arms compared to the legs. And this becomes non-subjective. Everybody that does this would get the same reading so long as they can do it correctly, but it standardizes our approach. It simply gives you a ratio, a percentage of how much blood is getting down to that foot. ABPIs are fantastic because they're relatively simple to do, they're relatively quick and they're relatively cheap. The difficulty is though, it only measures that macro circulation. So in other words, those name vessels all the way down. It doesn't actually assess the microcirculation right down into the distal aspect of the tissues. Additionally, it can be really difficult in patients with end stage renal disease or diabetes because you get arterial wall calcification. So no matter what you do to that blood pressure cuff, you cannot completely occlude the cuff. So therefore you get falsely elevated pressures. If you have got a patient though that you're assessing and you think you can feel a foot pulse and their ABPI is borderline, what can be really useful in diagnosing peripheral arterial disease is simply make them walk. Make them walk, make them have the pain, then test the ABPI again. 
if it's dropped, it can be an indication of significant peripheral arterial disease. So in ABPI, you'll have all seen these types of diagrams. So just to remind you how to calculate an ABPI, if you were thinking of calculating the left leg, you take the highest reading of the foot, you would divide it by the highest reading of the brachial pressures, no matter which arm, and you would simply do a calculation of 150 over 150, which is one, so 100% of the blood is getting down to that leg. If you do the same to the other side, you take the highest pressure, which is 75, you'd still divide it over the 150, 150 over 100, 75 over 150 is 0.5, so 50% of the blood getting down there. And that's as simple as what an ABPI is. It's a ratio of percentage of macro circulation. And when we talk about peripheral arterial disease, the values are slightly more different. If you're a community nurse practitioner, you will be quite comfortable at knowing that 0.8 to 1.3 is safe to apply compression therapy. For peripheral arterial disease, it, it, it's to be classed as normal arteries. If it's above 0.9 to 1.3, we class it as normal. If it's between 0.7 and 0.9, it's mild disease. 0.7 to 0.5 to 0.7, moderate disease. And below 0.5 is severe disease. What I'd say about the ABPI is trust it when it's low. It's going to be accurate. But if it's above 1.3, do not trust it. Do not think that you've ruled out significant arterial disease you could have just that vessel wall calcification. Because what you're trying to find is patients like this. You're trying to find those significant stenosis. So if you look at that top MR picture of his right leg, you can see that there's an occlusion right from his um, aortoilia all the way down really into the distal aspect of his, common, of his superficial femoral artery. You'd spot that straight away. The foot would be relatively cool, you would be developing symptoms, you would know about that instantly. But the more tricky ones to see is that MR picture at the bottom, where you've just got a significant narrowing within that common iliac artery on that left hand side. That's really difficult to spot because the patient may be asymptomatic, but his ABPI may be down at 0.7. He may well have some symptoms that start into claudication, and that's where we need your skills. There's many things that affect the quality of an ABPI. The one that's most troublesome is diabetes and that calcification. But there are other things that affect this too, in terms of arrhythmias, room temperature, vasoconstriction, anxiety, incorrect positioning of the patient, and my favourite is inappropriate gel. Grabbing the lubricating gel, because that's all you can find, you'll have an interference of the air bubbles, we need to use ultrasonic gel. So an ABPI though is a fantastic tool as a bedside test, but what else the ABPI is able to do is you can listen to the flows of the arteries with that Doppler probe. You'll have heard of uh, arterial waveforms. So a normal artery has a triphasic waveform, a shh, 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 shh. It consists of that forward flow at peak uh, velocity, the reverse flow at early diastole, and that late diastole push of that blood. As your arteries naturally harden as you get older, you can lose that final quiver of that muscular layer of the artery, and therefore you get this biphasic tone, the shh, 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 still normal. You can still hear the difference between the systolic push of the upstroke and the reverse flow in diastole. The one that signifies arterial disease is monophasic. So you get a <laughs> sound. And that's because you've got delayed acceleration and deceleration from that flow. So all of those sounds is about the heart movement. And if you've got upstream disease, that will be dampened down. So you'll just get a monophasic flow within your artery. They can be useful in terms of expanding your practice. Toe pressures, though, are the one that I think it's the new kids on the block. They seem to be emerging everywhere. We're certainly doing more toe pressures in our clinic than we ever have done. There is a slight difference in terms of the variation of the literature, in terms of what is normal or not. 
Um, normal is anything around 70 to 100 millimetres of mercury pressure or a TBI of 0.5 to 0.75. Anything below that level is diagnostic for peripheral arterial disease. And they are a fantastic tool for you to think about if you've got calcified vessels and an elevated AVPI. It's a brilliant tool because the most distal arteries do not get affected by um, calcification like the larger vessels. So you can put it all together in terms of what's the likelihood of significant peripheral arterial disease. And I love this slide that my, me and Martin Fox has developed because it's just telling you what's the increased likelihood of having peripheral arterial disease. Just to make you think about that brain training of, is this peripheral arterial disease? Do I need to do something about it? So hopefully all of that has given you a little bit of confidence in terms of what skills you've got to be able to diagnose peripheral arterial disease with a degree of confidence. But if we have got a patient with peripheral arterial disease who's showing signs of chronic limb-threatening ischemia, we do need to consider whether that patient needs revascularization on an individual patient basis. The treatments we have for patients with chronic limb threatening ischemia are either endovascular or surgical. Endovascular is angioplasty. Please don't worry about the terminology. Angiogram is a look. Angioplasty is the, is the stretch and we can stent in the same procedure. For the patient, it feels like one procedure. It's not any different. Within an angio, we can use a plain balloon or we can use a drug coated balloon. The drug coating balloons put a little bit of medicine on the artery wall to help to stop the reformation um, of the atheroma. We can also use stents, so little nitinal cages with a degree of radiological force to be able to push the artery out to keep it slightly widened. And we can use those again plain, or we can use those with drug eluting stents, the same drug. And you can see on this image at the top, you can see the, the impact of endovascular revascularization. You can see that actually there's a little teetering of a vessel at the top, and actually no name vessels as you go down through the leg. But look what happens following plain balloon angioplasty you're able to recannulize that vessel, restore that flow, and you know, salvage that foot. If endovascular though isn't an option for us or the patient is relatively young, we may consider surgical bypass. Surgical bypass is a complex procedure. It carries significant risk, but I must say that the surgeons are fantastic. If you've got a blockage within the thigh, they'll simply put a bypass above and be below that blockage. If you've got like this bottom film here, if you've got a problem in terms of an iliac occlusion, what they can do is pinch the blood from the right leg, plumb it over and actually plumb the, the left leg. If you've got a problem of the whole of the aorta, they can actually take the blood from the subclavian artery, tunnel it down and feed both of your lower legs. Um, on an aorto bifemoral graft. So there's lots that they can do, but unfortunately many patients still end up with amputation. We have a greater group of patients with diabetes who result in amputation, and that's because the diabetes tends to, the artery disease forms at the most distal aspect and works its way up. And the problem is with that, it gives us very limited options for bypass surgery, because with a bypass surgery, you need an artery above it, but also below it to be able to plug it back in. And if the disease has started right at the distal aspect, there's often no landing zone to be able to put that bypass onto. Patients who are smoker and gets more larger vessel disease, such as that picture up here at the top, their outcomes can be slightly better because we've got more options in terms of bypass but we need to reduce the overall figures of amputation across the globe. And that's where it comes to really what we need to do once we have successfully revascularized a patient, because there's a unique window of opportunity to be able to heal that patient, because the patency of an angioplasty or a bypass is unknown. Some of these things may only last two or three weeks, 
Some of them may last 12 months, two years, three years, but we do not know how long our revascularization procedure is going to last. Therefore, as soon as we've done it, we really need to focus on that wound healing. And the first aspect of wound healing is that debridement. We need good tissue bed preparation that is rapid because until we clear the debris, this wound will not go on to heal. So these are pictures of patients with critical limb ischemia on the left hand side. This is what commonly uh, gets present. Both of the, that patient at the top is a diabetic. The one at the bottom is a non-diabetic patient. And both of those patients will end up losing their toes. And you will have seen many post-operative pictures and patients like these two on the right hand side. We amputate the toes, we leave the socket open to heal by secondary intention. And guess what happens quite quickly? We get this plug of slough that occurs. And actually we need to remove that slough as soon as possible because that is harboring a biofilm. It's a breeding ground for bacteria, reducing the risk, increasing the risk of infection and it's stalling that precious wound healing. So just to remind you what slough is, Slough is normal, it is part of that normal inflammatory process of that stage of wound healing. It is typically pale in colour like this, but I can tell you I've seen it all the way from tan brown to, 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 to nearly green. And um, There's a huge variation in the colour that you can see. Slough consists, consists of mostly debris. It's, a deb it's, a, it's the debris from the fibrin, white blood cells, bacteria, dead tissues, and other uh, proteasis material. So all of this can actually just form onto that wound bed, but until you've removed it, that wound is not going to improve. And actually what we know more of these days is actually within any wound that is not healing, 80% of them will be covered with a biofilm. Biofilm is a group of multi-species organs, organized uh, uh, bacterial species that sticks on the wound bed. And they start to set off this substance called EPS. Think of that like treacle. It sticks them to the wound bed, it sticks them to each other and provides a bit of a protective dome over the top of them, so therefore they can't be disrupted. And if you've got an established biofilm, it will impact on wound healing because it increases the chronic inflammation, it increases the exudate and you get cell senescence. While those cells are covered in all of that treacle, they'll simply go to sleep, they'll stop their active wound healing. So we need to think about tackling the slough, but at the same time, reducing that biofilm that we know will be there. So slough is a real barrier to wound healing. It, it also makes assessment really difficult. You know those two pictures that I showed you of those sockets covered in slough? You don't know whether bone is exposed at the base of that or not because it's covered with slough. It makes assessment really difficult. We need to remove it to be able to assess the wound accurately. It will delay that wound healing process because it prolongs that chronic inflammatory response. That increase of proteases, cytokines will increase exudate levels. All of this becomes a feeding ground for bacteria. It can mimic or hide infection. It increases the amount of odor and ultimately it stops the wound from progressing to healing. So we need to debride that. And actually, when we think about debridement of these wounds, we need to want something that's quick and accessible. And actually, this is where I think the beauty of larval therapy comes in. I love these little maggots. They start off the tiniest of little things. And when you take them off, they're the size of a fishing maggot. The maggots have been used for over a century now within wound care. And they got a bit, little bit out of fashion in the 1940s, 50s, once antibiotics started to be used. But actually, they were reintroduced in the 1980s. The UK has been using them by, since 1995. And they have huge advantages, especially in the group of patients with peripheral arterial disease, because they're extremely selective. They're rapid debriders. They're extremely easy to use now that they come in tea bags. They secrete an antimicrobial property and compound. Therefore, they can break down that biofilm. It reduces the inflammation. And actually, we're looking more and more that the maggot secretion actually stimulates wound healing on its own. 
So maggots are fantastic. This is an old picture. It's when we used to put them on free range, if you like. And they were a little bit tricky to use because it was like playing whack-a-mole trying to get them off. Luckily, things have evolved and now maggots come in these beautiful tea bags, dead easy, easy to use. You can't get any escape heats. And if you think about a wound like that, if you were going to take a blade to that, you're not going to be overly subject, it's selective. There's crevices inside everywhere. We need to preserve as much tissue as possible. And that's where larvae therapy really comes in. It can be used on wet, sluffy tissue, like that far left, especially on that leg ulcer that's got that beautiful bit of a cavity. That's just crying out for a bio bag to put inside of it. On that middle wound, you can see that actually that slough is movable. It's like a blancmange on the top. That can look beautifully be lifted by larvae therapy being placed on top. What we shouldn't be using larvae therapy on though is that far picture on the left hand side. If you've got these completely black digits, we should simply wait for auto amputation of that. We shouldn't be actively debriding that patient. So many of you out there may think you've got some good blade skills. You may think that, you know what, I might mechanically remove that with a blade. I just want to show you the beauty of larval therapy because actually would anybody be brave enough to remove that necrotic tissue slash hematoma that sat on top of that foot, knowing that all those tendons are just behind it and you're desperately wanting to preserve that function of the foot. You can see what one application of larval therapy does. It cleans it up from that necrotic tissue to that middle picture, allowing you to put topical negative pressure on to stimulate that granulation growth. And look how beautiful that wound is now. And that wound went on to heal within a short period of time. Again, even if you do think that you've got good blade skills like this, sometimes your blade skills just isn't enough. With this eschar on the top, I was able to lift the majority of this with a blade, but look what was still left underneath. We still had patches of this sloughy tissue, superficial slough. We've got increasing amounts of maceration happening. We know that there's probably a biofilm that's causing trouble. One application of larval therapy cleans up the wounds. It's got rid of that uh, bacterial burden. You're reducing your maceration. You are kickstarting that wound towards healing. So just to summarise, really, um, I just want you all to be brilliant of what you do. I want you to be able to recognise peripheral arterial disease. Be, please, please be part of this solution. We need to recognise peripheral arterial disease to save lives and also to save limbs. We need patients earlier on in their chronic limb threatening ischemic pathway. I hope you will feel more confident now in assessing your patients with peripheral arterial disease. Remember, any patient with critical limb ischemia needs urgent revascularization. You need to be pushing them down the pathways. But once we revascularize a patient, there is a window of opportunity. And this window of opportunity may be very narrow. Therefore, you need to start concentrating on your wound bed preparation. Debridement is often needed. Choose a method that's selective, effective and rapid. Focus on that wound healing while that wind opportunity stays open. And I think larval therapy really helps in that rapid selective debridement to help these patients heal, help us to save more limbs. Thank you very much for listening. It was a whistle stop tour to peripheral arterial disease. I hope you found it informative and I'll welcome any questions. Thank you, Leanne. That was such a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed watching it and um, certainly learned a lot as well. So I'm sure everybody did at home as well who was joining us this evening. So everybody, now is the time to get your questions in for Leanne. So let's just have a little look, Leanne, and we'll see what questions have come through so far for you. Oh, and at this stage as well, everybody, I should let you know I am going to be inviting my colleague, Vicky Phillips, onto the webinar. Vicky is our clinical support manager here at Biomond. So if you've got any questions specifically around larval therapy, do please feel free to pop those into the Q&A as well, and Vicky can help with answering those for you. So Leanne, if you're ready, we'll dive into the questions. So the first one we've got through from Michelle is, should best medical therapy be for any level of PAD? Yes, 
Simple answer, yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, if you've got that, if you've got a proven diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease, then yes, patients should be on best medical therapy. That being clopidogrel, seventy-five milligrams, and atorvastatin, eighty milligrams in the UK. I don't know what the guidance is for the rest of the, the globe. Um, I think the challenge to that person though is, is how do we detect peripheral arterial disease on patients who are asymptomatic? I think if you are a community practitioner especially a community podiatrist, I think there's a great role for you in terms of being that early detector. If you can spot peripheral arterial disease, you may prevent a heart attack or a stroke on somebody. Big impact you could have by doing little tiny things. Wow, wonderful. Thank you very much for clarifying that one. Um, and the next question that's come through from you, for you again from Michelle, um, she said, within the trusts, who would you contact to find out about structured exercise programmes? Um, well, first off, um, you could ask, you send an email um, simply to your vascular team because they'll know whether they've got one locally or not. Um, the last time we looked, it was only 25% of patients across the UK could access um, structured exercise. Um, some people can get enrolled onto their cardio exercise. So if you know who's doing your cardio exercise in terms of post cardiac event, and uh, you could contact them and see if they'll accept patients with peripheral arterial disease. The other way is you can simply ask your commissioners if they are commissioning this. I'd sort of like you to ask that question and I'd like you to ask them to challenge them why they're not, if they're not providing it. Fab, thank you. Um, and Kathleen is asking, do you have an opinion on automated ABPI machines versus manual methods? Um, I do have an opinion. Um, I have an opinion on everything. <laughs> um, you could ask my husband that. Um, <laughs> so um, automated ABPI machines, I think, are useful out in general practice where you haven't got ex perfect hands of doing an ABPI. I think they're a fantastic screening tool to be able to do it. In my hands, waste of time, because I don't just want an ABPI, I want to listen to the Doppler waveform, I want to hear it in my ears, I want to see it, I want to do many things. I also find that the automated machines are fantastic at spotting your normal, but as soon as you go outside of that norm, they just sometimes just throw an error reading. So therefore it's not helpful at detecting an ABPI of 0.6 or 0.5. And um, so um, it depends on what you're using them for. If you class yourself as an expert in peripheral arterial disease or want to be an expert, get a handheld Doppler. If you're a generalist and you just need an ABPI to move a patient through a pathway, that's where I think the automated devices fit. Watch out, NICE are doing a technology appraisal on the automated devices, whether they are good and selective, um, it's out for draft consultation at this moment in time. Look at NICE. I think it might be only out to stakeholders, but it should be out for full consultation towards the end of this year. And um, so just look out for NICE ABPI automated devices. It's on its way. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Leanne. Um, and Stacey's asking about gross limb edemia. And does gross limb swelling need a vascular referral to manage very le wet legs if TBPI or ABPI is unattainable? Oh God, what a good question. So, <laughs> so um, first off, gross limb swelling with lymph area and wet legs needs strong compression, 100%. It's about making sure your strong compression is going to be um, non-harmful. So in other words, you haven't got significant peripheral arterial disease. You have to do that by a structured way. If you can't do an ABPI in a toe pressure, can you convince yourself, can you feel a foot pulse? Can you hear that Doppler tone? You can feel a foot pulse and it's at least biphasic or triphasic. To me, I would compress that patient because there's more harm from your ap apathy of no compression than the risk of compression in that individual patient. But you need to have a degree of confidence with this. Another document to watch out for is the British Lymphology Society about the role of ABPI in patients with large limbs. Um, it should be out in conference, which is in the next couple of weeks. And it's a great document that talks you through having this staged approach. I think one of the ways that you can safeguard your patients is being good at looking for signs and symptoms of arterial disease. You're not going to spot the asymptomatic, but at least you're going to rule out those with moderate to severe disease. So watch out for the British Lymphology Society document uh, on ABPIs. It's coming out. 
Great, thank you. Um, and the next question from Alice, I'm actually going to ask both of you to provide an input for this one, if that's okay. Um, and she's asking for advice um, for debridement in patients with arterial wounds, as there can be a little bit of fear surrounding this. And to me, no fear post revascularization, have fear pre revascularization. Once they've been revascularized, if it's already sluffy, you're not going to do any harm by uh, debriding them. If they've got dry eschar of a digit, leave it well alone. Dry eschar on a wound lab is not going to help you. But if it's already sluffy, you're not going to do any harm by debriding that wound. Vicky, what do you think? Yeah, I agree, really. Um, the, the larvae aren't going to necessarily do any harm, but you might just find that if you've not revascularized, then you're just going to keep re-sloughing. So that's the only thing. Perfect. Thank you both. Uh, and the next question from Iram is, um, with removing slough, um, is that why silver-based primary dressings are used? Are they used to lift the slough off? So, so many of the dressings that we use in wound care are designed to debride autolytically. So remember what autolytic debridement is. Autolytic debridement is your body's natural response. Your body pulls through um, uh, moisture and enzymes to debride superficial slough and it slowly uh, debrides away. And all of the wound dressings that are marketed across the UK at least are designed either to donate extra fluid to make that more rapid or provide a greenhouse effect to keep your fluid at the base of that wound to help that autolysis. Autolytic debridement is a slow process. If you put a piece of hydrofiber on, it's going to be three to four weeks at least before it's clean. We may not have that window opportunity with patients with arterial disease who've been revascularized. We need to get to a, if you've got slough, you're in a minus position. We need to get to at least a day zero position to start wound healing. We need to get to that day zero as soon as possible. Larvae therapy is a lot, 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 lot quicker at debridement. You're probably going to need one or two applications. The most I ever put on is three applications and I'm always down to 100% clean wound bed. Wonderful, thank you. And I can see Iram's actually provided some further information in a follow-up question here for you both. So um, they've initially tried a silver-based dressing, um, then they've gone on to use larval therapy. Um, they're saying that the slough on the left of the wound has massively improved, but then unfortunately the wound does go back to the start. They're asking what should they do in this instance? Go back to your pathophysiology, there's something wrong. Um, you're, you're trying your best to prepare that wound, but the body's just not allowing it to heal. You need to look at everything else. We check your revascularization status, look at everything else of that wider picture, diabetic control, HB, uh, anemia, what medication are they on? What's the nutrition level like? Start looking further afield to answer that question of why they're not healing. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Vicky, a question from Suzanne for you. Okay. Um, can an ulcer ever be too sluffy to use larval therapy on? That's a good question. So not really. The only thing I would say is obviously you have different types of slough. So if you have a very, very wet sluffy wound then there's potential to drown the maggots um, and of course if your slough is getting to the point where it's getting very hard you're getting to more like that knock on wood necrosis and you're probably going to want to soften it before you put the larvae on but no you can't really have too sluffy a wound no they'll love it Perfect, thank you. Um, and again, from one of the questions earlier, um, Alice, who asked about debridement in patients with arterial disease and the fear surrounding that, um, she said that she was specifically looking for some information on sharp debridement, please. Oh, um, sharp debridement, I think, um, needs to be extremely selective. Uh, you, you have to have it in good hands. Most peripheral arterial disease wounds exist on the foot. The foot is the most complex of structure. Only, you only need to go down a little bit, you're on tendons, you're on nerves, you're on arteries. Be fearful of sharp debridement of a foot. And um, I think that you need to be the best of your gain if you're going to pick up a scalpel to be able to debride a wound on a foot. I think curette debridement is slightly easier for the generalist to use and um, because it's slightly safer and um, because it's, it's like a polo rather than a blade, if you like. Um, but again, You've just got to be wary of all of those structures that you're playing with underneath that. And um, even I get slightly hesitant when I get my blade out to debride a wound on a foot, and um, such as that that I showed you with that hematoma. I just didn't dare. 
because I knew what were underneath it. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you want to do is to impact that patient's long-term function by you being a little bit heroic. The maggots can do what I can, you know, even if I got it off with a blade, three, four, five days, the maggots have done the job and they've done it with 100% safety. We have that time. We can do it on a safe fashion. Great, thank you. Um, and with the next question we've had through from Kathleen. So she's had a patient through who's on an exercise claudication programme. They've got chronic ischemic limb um, and they've said they've had pain today as well. Um, and they've mentioned that they feel like they're walking on pebbles. They've got no plantar lesions and no ulceration. Um, she's wondering, is there any prevalence of painful neurothopathy? Ooh, neuro <laughs> Bear with me. Neuropathy in ischemic feet. If you want yeah. me to repeat that, I can. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, no. And, and, yeah, and when you've got ischemia, you always get an um, uh, exacerbation or irritation of the nerves. So you'll often get a neuropathic pain element on top of an ischemic pain element. It's very common to hear patients feeling like they're walking on pebbles. And um, the only way to manage that is medication designed for um, neuropathy. Uh, Pregabalin, gabapentin, amitriptyline can help. Um, I would, with that patient though, if they've already been through exercise and they're having no improvements and they've still got really short distance claudication with signs of tipping into arterial rest pain, I would ask for that patient to be reviewed by the vascular team just to see what their options are in revascularization. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and the next question we've had through from Michelle, um, she's saying CLTI is PAD with a wound or PAD with a rest pain? Indeed. Okay. <laughs> so so um, um, chronic limb threatening ischemia um, it is arterial rest pain or arterial ulceration. That's what we class as uh, chronic limb threatening ischemia. And then towards the end of that, you can have patients with what we class as critical limb ischemia. In other words, there's a real time issue here that's about to tip them into trouble, if not. And the terminology has changed over the last two years. It's sort of, remember, if you can remember, we changed from COAD to COPD. We went from stroke to CVA back to stroke again. I wouldn't get hit up, hit up on the terminology. I'd get hit up more about recognition of the signs and symptoms and you being comfortable with this needs a referral now, or this doesn't need a referral now. If they've got claudications, they don't need a referral to a vascular center now. If they've got signs of uh, chronic limb threatening ischemia, arterial rest pain or tissue loss, they need a referral to a vascular center. Fab, okay, thank you. Um, and the next question from Catherine again is around uh, CLTI legs. Um, she's asking, should a CLTI leg be revascular revascularized before larvae can be used? I don't know if both of you want to take this one. To, to me, the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, because all you're going to do is, the, the larvae is brilliant at debridement, but they're not Harry Potter's magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> a, 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 but, a wound needs blood supply to heal. Um, and therefore, if you have a wound and you're going to start to debride it, you are going to make that wound bigger by the nature of debridement. And therefore, you can increase the risk of wound growth, re-sloughing, wound growth, re-sloughing. Wait until revascularization has occurred. Then it's your wind of opportunity to be very strong and bold with your uh, debridement. Oh, great. Thank you, Leanne. Um, now, Sunita has gone on to ask, um, so this she's got some confusion just surrounding um, when uh, diagnosing a necrotic heel as a pressure ulcer, um, that the ABPI mm -hmm. is clearly less than 0.5 uh, centimetres. Should they call it a pressure ulcer or should it be an ischemic ulcer instead? Oh, well, what a good question that is. And now I feel like we need a pint of beer at the pub to debate <laughs> this one. OK, so... Um, I am a great believer in any patient with a heel pressure ulcer should have an ABPI because what we need to do is determine what are the underlying factors because you can have a diabetic patient who's just had a long hospital stay and underlying peripheral arterial disease and they develop heel pressure ulcer. Is that a pressure ulcer? Is it a diabetic foot lesion? Is it an arterial lesion? I think wherever we need to document that ABPI, because I think sometimes it safeguards against 
our community staff are our hospital staff being blamed for that pressure ulcer occurring. I also think it's really important to get the right people involved. If you call it just a pressure ulcer, you won't see a vascular surgeon. You won't see a diabetic foot MDT. So actually what we need to be doing is working more closely together, ensuring that we've got the widest discipline in this. Um, but it's a great question to ask. What I would say is have a look at the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, their clinical recommendations for lower limb. It talks about how we define a ulcer on a heel, whether you'd call that pressure, who should that belong to? Um, the line seems to be going, that any wound on the foot, they should have an input from a podiatrist. It shouldn't be purely nurse led, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and I should say to everybody at home, thank you so, so much for your questions. There's so many coming through and thank you, Leanne, for taking the time to answer these um, in such a detailed way. I'm sure everybody's really appreciating your time this evening. Um, so the next question from Katie, um, she's asking, could you please kindly explain the arterial flushing in the foot? Um, she's wondering if the oxygenated blood is not getting down there, why does it flush? So it, it flushes simply because of vasodilation. So if you have a restriction of your blood supply that's supplying that foot, these cells down here, this capillary bed that I showed you, go, where is my blood? Where is my oxygen? And therefore, they maximally dilate. So anything that comes down to them, they get. Any patient with critical limb ischemia will be getting a degree of blood supply. It won't be going down the main arteries but it'll be going down those collaterals, it'll be going down the, the superficial circulation system that exists around it. So they will be getting a degree of blood down there. So for the when the blood goes down, these vessels are at maximum dilation, they get the blood and it looks flushed. And that's what happens. Um, and that's why with patients with peripheral artillery disease, you can often get swelling as well. Because at the same time as they want in every bit of hemoglobin, they also accept every bit of plasma that gets stuck in the lymph lymphatics and therefore you can get a degree of swelling. But a, a sunset foot is a fantastic clinical indication of chronic limb threatening ischemia. Great, thanks Leanne. Um, and Kat has asked that she's noticed that you measure both the DP and the TA for the ABPI, um, but the automated machines encourage the TA such as the ability. Um, is this a problem? No, it's just understanding the nuances between all of the devices is what I'd say. Um, it, it, it's interesting that one of the devices, the automated devices, do, does measure the pressure at two points. Another of the automated devices doesn't measure the pressure at two points, it just measures it at one point. So I think it's just about understanding the nuances of the automated machine. It's another reason why I like a handheld device, because I do like to check two arteries. Because remember that the, the dos edis pedis can be naturally absent in around 8% of the population. And that's just how you are born. So, you know, we've just got to be careful of making sure if we're diagnosing PAD, they've truly got PAD. They've not just got an anatomical variant. Hmm. Fab, thank you. And um, Vicky, a few questions coming through regarding larvae. So I'll put those really? to you. Um, so the first one we've got is if maggots are lost in a cavity wound, how do I get them out? Um, well, that's a really good question. Um, it'd be difficult to lose them now because we don't do free range. So they, um, you know, they all come in the bag and they can't escape that bag unless uh, unless you accidentally cut it open, which, you know, hopefully if you're if you're being careful, you're not doing. Um, if you got like I call the rogue maggots that you generally get over the summertime, um, there's a couple of things you can do. So um, you can either cover that wound in like a film dressing or even just some cling film that suffocates the maggots and then they will drop out that way. Or you can just irrigate them out um, and, you know, flush them out that way. And I suppose the 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 um, I've I've been using maggots for many years, and I was one of those that pulled it out of the pot, and we we only had free range, and, and I yeah. loved doing it, um, and I was really fearful that when the maggots got put in the tea bag, I, I felt very sorry for the maggots because I thought maggots debrided by eating the sloppy tissue, yeah, okay. and, and I thought how are they going to eat the sloppy tissue when you put them in a in a tea bag? they're not going to be able to eat and actually these two things are not teeth the straws no. so so what they do is they deposit 
that enzymatic fluid that dissolves the dead tissue That's and then right. they suck it back up again. So you can still have that action through a tea bag with none of the rogue maggots. I've lost one or I've found one yeah. on the side of the pillar of the patient. So they're still as clinically effective. You've just got to remember the action of the larvae is they don't actually eat the dead tissue. They basically it's, it's secrete, dissolve it. and suck. Yeah, it's all very glamorous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's so satisfying when you take them off and the size of, of, of a fishing maggot in that wound Absolutely. clean it does make you a little bit of joyful. And I suppose <laughs> the only other thing that, that I'd like to say to the audience really is you may think of maggots as being horrid um, and ooh, why would I have that put on my foot? Um, and I don't think any of us here in this audience would you know, happily put a bag of maggots and sleep with them tonight in bed. But you're not in the patient's position. If you're in that position where you've already think and been told that you could lose your leg and all of a sudden you're left with a sloughy wound and then somebody's saying to you, there is an opportunity of cleaning this wound up and let it starting to heal, would you have a bag of maggots to try to preserve your leg? And then I think everybody would sleep with a bag of maggots today. So please, please don't let your own personal feelings portrayed onto that patient. Only if you're in that situation can you make that decision. And none of my patients have ever turned down larvae therapy because by the time they're needing larvae therapy, unfortunately, they're way down the journey and they're looking for any door to stop progression down that limb loss journey. So true. Thank you, Leanne. Um, and somebody else is asking Vic um, just about accessing larval therapy within the community. Okay, so um, so I'm guessing from like a, a application. Yeah, so how would they access the therapy? What would they need to do? So in the UK, larval therapy is classed as an unlicensed pharmaceutical. So that needs, means it needs to be prescribed. Um, so because it's unlicensed, that means it has to be a GP or, you know, any doctor, um, independent nurse prescribers, some supplementary prescribers can write it up, but that's very much dependent on a trust by trust basis. So if you're a supplementary prescriber, you need to check that you are covered. And then it's just pretty much like any other um, pharmaceutical. So the prescription goes to, to pharmacy, to the patient's um, chemist, and then they would place an order with us. Um, and as long as we get that order by 2 p.m. Monday to Friday, then you can have a next day delivery. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's 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 no different to in the hospital, really. Fab, thank you very much, Vicky. Um, and just going back to um, a question on ABPI for you, Leanne. Um, someone has asked, uh, when you have um, calcification stopping occlusion during ABPI, how high do you go? And what's the best way to differentiate between normal HTN and calcification? So the, the one thing that you need to do before you start pumping up the, the, the cuff around the limb is you need to be mindful of what their, their brachial pressure is, because that's going to give you an indication of how high do you need to go. So if your top pressure is 180, you need to keep pumping until you get to 180, 200, 220. If the top pressure is already at 120 and you're getting yourself to 200, 220, it's time to stop. You already know you've got calcification that's getting in there. So th there's two things that make you stop. Think about what your top pressure is, how far above it have you gone. And the second thing, if you're causing your patient any discomfort, you stop straight away. And um, so do your top pressure and just see to where it goes. And um, some patients you can tolerate right up to 160, 180 to the top of your dial. Most patients I tend to stop 240-ish um, if they've got a normal pressure of, let's say, 140 of the arm. You know you're already way off the scale but use the brachial pressure as your first, how high do I need to go? That'll set you back. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and Gillian is asking, um, could you signpost to any good patient education materials for PAD, please? Oh, good grief, of course I can. <laughs> um, I was the proud chair of the Legs Matters campaign. Just have a look at legsmatters.org. There is some fantastic patient information in there um, for patients and carers about peripheral arterial disease and many other lower limb conditions. And there's also some great information for practitioners in terms of how to recognise, how to treat and the urgency of peripheral arterial disease. 
Wonderful, thank you. And the questions are just keeping coming through this evening, ladies. So thank you for your time again for answering these. And thank you to everybody at home for keeping submitting them. It's great. Um, so the next question has come through. It says, uh, there seems to be a gap in linking um, in patients who have vascular problems to hospital services. Um, but if those patients don't have diabetes um, and they're asking, um, do you have um, a, a, any problems with bridging this gap? Do you know anything about that, Leanne? Would you be able to advise? <laughs> yeah, I'm Unfortunately, in the NHS, we call ourselves a national health service, but we're very different in every flipping postcode. And all I'd say is find your vascular surgeons who you work locally with, make relationships with them. They do want to see these patients. Um, you just need to build. There's some fantastic relationships around. Um, Naz is a vascular surgeon over at Manchester, set up a fantastic support team for all his community nurses and, and, and podiatrists over that side. They've got some really, really good, strong links. Here within Mid Yorks, we accept a referral from any community nurse any podiatrist, if they've got a wound, you can refer them straight into vascular. We don't want a GP to be involved in any of that. We just want to see the patient quicker. So there are models that exist that are good. Um, I, I have no solution, unfortunately, of a magic wand of solving the problem across the UK. What I would say is though, find out where your vascular service is, both in terms of where's your local outpatients and where's your inpatient beds. There might be two separate things. And, and find out who could be your contact at that and just start to build a relationship. Ask to go and spend time with them in their diabetic foot clinic or a hot foot clinic or their critical and ischemic clinic and just try to wheedle your way in. And um, vascular surgeons are lovely. And um, 90% of them are absolutely lovely. And they're quite happy to be told what to do by a nurse or an allied health professional. Great, thank you. Um, so a question from Jane has come through. Um, she said they're based in palliative care um, and they've had a patient presented to them with wet slough and arterial disease. Um, she's wondering, do they debride or still try to dry out the wet slough? Um, she said it often seems impossible um, and they do worry about bio burden in the wound and any infection risk to the patient as well. Um, she said often inodine is used, but it does seem futile as it washes away so quickly. Do you have any thoughts on this? It depends on what you say in terms of palliative care. If we're talking about palliative care, end of life, forget the wound, patient comfort is the way forward. And when you talk about patient comfort, it's about patient and family comfort too. So if you've got a really smelly, sloppy wound on a palliative patient, sometimes we do use larval therapy just to reduce the bio burden, to reduce the odour and help with that patient's comfort and that family's experience of that. I would be saying though that that's a rare thing to do. If it's very sloughy and wet, then yes, go for the lava. But if at all possible, try to dry it up. The inodine's probably is as good as you're gonna get. It's not brilliant, but really it's more about symptom management of that patient because you're not gonna heal that wound. They're in end of life and um, it's about symptom management. So usually larvae, but I'd be saying use my larvae as part of odour symptom management, yeah. not about wound bed preparation. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Uh, the next question that's come through is, uh, what's your opinion about doing Doppler while a patient's in a chair um, and if the patient can't lie down in bed? Pointless, <laughs> forget it, don't bother. <laughs> um, it's gonna be meaningless, it's, it's non-reliable, um, absolutely meaningless, forget it. Perfect. Thank you for answering that one and for being so honest as well. <laughs> um, Sarah's asking, so for chronic vascular wounds um, in the UK, so they're using a wounds express machine as a vascular therapy in the NHS and the private service. Um, and she's wondering, have you got any thoughts on this machine? What what do you would you recommend it? Um, so um, I have thoughts on this machine in terms of the science of what it is supposed to do seems sound. Um, it does seem to increase arterial perfusion on a scientific point of view and also improve venous return. And so therefore will help tissue perfusion from a scientific point of view. There is no evidence though that it's cost effective in terms of the management of the patient. It certainly won't do you any harm. Um, my own father, bless him, um, suffered from critical limb ischemic as he was dying. Um, it, it's like being busman's holiday. I took off two yeah. of his toes in his last six weeks of his life, bless him. Um, I use it on my dad. 
because I just wanted anything to help with his pain. Um, did it work? Who knows? Um, I wouldn't recommend it on any patient at this moment in time unless you've explored every single option or until the science gets stronger. I do know that there's a randomized control study happening at this moment in time. Looking at that, we should be able to have the evidence. I don't mind it being used right at the end when you've explored all options um, and non-healing, because you might as well. But at the moment, um, the bench science makes sense. It hasn't been proven to be clinically effective. Mm. Fab, thank you. And I should say, apologies, Sarah, I did misread that question. You're not currently using it, but you did just want some thoughts around it. So thank you, Leanne, for answering that for Sarah. But all, with, all of, with all of these questions, remember, it's the thoughts of one. Um, so, so, you know, um, this is my opinion. Um, don't take everything I say as complete black and white. Within medicine, there's always a great ground in the middle that's up for academic discussion. And um, so hopefully I'm giving you some points in terms of your debating techniques. Um, but, you know, there's always a great ground in medicine. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, another question for you, Leanne, from Katie. So she said, um, in your opinion, how often in an NHS trust should PAD, ABPI screenings be done? Is it just at new assessment, uh, at regular interviews and, or a separate appointment? Um, she's just thinking of asymptomatic patients and is there a scope for this as a service? Um, no. So um, whole population screening of patients, in other words, all of us having an ABPI, um, is not cost effective um, and that's because of the number of patients you need the number of people you need to do it on to be able to detect and um, so there is no across the UK population screening for asymptomatic diseases it's not funded by the NHS and um, I think that comes with that though is a couple of things if a patient's known to have peripheral arterial disease um, then um, an ABPI can give them some reassurance if it's getting better or if it's getting worse. If a patient's in compression therapy, there is a recommendation that the ABPI is repeated on a six to 12 monthly basis. Um, so, uh, but there is no definitive. What I like to say is I recheck an ABPI when my patient presents or if there's a change in the symptoms um, or if there's a new wound occurred. So it's just about whenever you've got a step change, if you like, in your patient pathway, it's about just going read back, reassessing, including the arterial assessment. Great, thank you. And this does follow on quite nicely, actually, to the next question from Sam, who's asking, would you agree that all new inpatient admissions should be screened for their ABPI, or should this only be done if they have clinical needs, such as being vascular patients? Only if they've got clinical needs. Um, again, it goes back to um, there is no evidence about whole population screening. It is not proven to be cost effective. Great. OK, thank you. Um, and Clara's asking, so when doing an ABPI to save time, can you use an automated BP cuff to get the brachial reading instead of using a Doppler? Yes, you can. It's a lovely cheat. Just make sure you're doing it at the same time. You can't take the blood pressure and then 10 minutes later take the leg pressure. You need to be doing it at the same same time ish of doing your leg pressure so it's got to be very very close to it just don't forget you need to take both arms not just one but yeah you can certainly use dynamap a nice hint and tip with that though first just check the radial pulse if it's regular your dynamax is going to be reliable if it's irregular it may not be reliable think about af think about a handheld abpi but if you come to my clinic They've all got dynamats around their arms and manual cuffs around the legs. Great, thank you. And I must say, Leanne, you're very popular this evening. So many questions are coming through. So thank you once again, Leanne, and to everybody at home. Um, Ruth is asking uh, if uh, they suspect, suspect PAD in private practice, how do they refer quickly to vascular services? Would you recommend bypassing GP referral given the current stress on general practice? Yes. Um, so if you've been seen in private practice, it all depends on your commissioning rules. Um, if a patient that you've seen in private practice has developed symptoms of chronic limb threatening ischemia, there is a clinical urgency, um, there's no issue with commissioning, send that referral straight off, copy the GP into it, and um, any vascular surgeon will accept that referral. If that referral is for peripheral arterial disease and intermittent claudication, that referral should go back to their GP because not all claudication needs to be referred to a vascular service. It can be appropriately managed in community if you've got the right setup. 
Wonderful, thank you. And um, Jennifer's asking um, a question just regarding patient care. Um, they've got a patient with edema swelling on their right on their right foot only. Um, there's no lesions present, um, but she's saying that the patient has been given antibiotics and the swelling has been said to reduce. Um, what would you suggest, um, sort of regarding investigation, Leanne? Um, so obviously, I can't give individualized patient advice. If you've got localized swelling on the foot. I bet you'd anything it was an infection um, is what I'd be, I'd be questioning. I'd be questioning is that chronic edema that's caused a chronic inflammatory response, therefore you've got the redness. So I'd be going down the lines of why have you got edema on your foot? So I'd be looking at the venous system, I'd be looking at the lymphatic system, I'd be looking at can I compress this um, to be able to control it? Because I think that what you're seeing that's mimicking in, infection is actually inflammation um, and inflammation probably needs treating by um, compression um, but it's about going back to the drawing board and looking for the underlying pathophysiology there wonderful thank you and linda's just asking about the waveforms that you um, demonstrated during your presentation leanne um, she's wondering um what the mono buy and try um, waveforms mean and she's wondering if there's anywhere to learn a little bit more about um, atypical waveforms yeah, there is. There's a fantastic learning set that Andrew Sharp did. Um, he was a podiatrist at the University of Huddersfield at the time, I think. Um, he's done a, a, I'm sure if you contact the Royal College of Podiatry, they'll be able to let you know it, of what you need to do. Um, he collected about 50 different waveforms. Um, and you can listen to them all. And it's like, have I got it right or have I got it wrong? Is it biphasic, is it triphasic, is it monophasic? It really helps to think about what your ears are listening to. And um, a top tip though, if you're gonna buy a new Doppler, buy one with a visible screen on it. Because when you hear a waveform, we all can hear different things. If you see a waveform, you can't get it wrong. If it crosses the bottom line, it's at least biphasic. It's much more easy to interpret. A triphasic waveform is the systolic action, the diastole action, and the regurgitation of the arteries. It sounds like shh, 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 normal. As you get older, you lose that elastic aspect of your artery. So therefore you get a biphasic tone, two tones. Shh, 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 shh. Still you hear the action of the heart, the push of the blood, the release of the blood. The monophasic tone is the one that indicates peripheral arterial disease. You get a hump dampen sound, a and that's because you've lost the action of the heart because of the stenosis that's happening above it. So all you're hearing is unidirectional blood flow. You've lost the pump action of the heart. It's a clear indication of peripheral arterial disease. But have a look at Andrew Sharp's um, stuff from the College of Podiatry. He's got a library of these sounds um, and it's a fantastic resource. Oh, amazing. Thank you for providing that. Um, now, a couple of questions on toe pressure, Leanne. So, Marie is asking, what are your thoughts on automated toe pressure machines such as Sisto? Um, I don't mind them as much as I don't, as, as, as I don't really like the automated ABPI machines. I see there's a place. I don't actually mind the automated um, TBI machines because I'm not too sure you can do it so wrong. Um, I would, I don't know about the evidence. What I would want to do before I use one in clinical practice, though, is to actually examine the literature that goes behind him in terms of their sensitivity and specificity of picking up peripheral arterial disease. So what I'd urge you to do is find the actual literature that proves that they are sensitive and selective of peripheral arterial disease. Um, I think they will be, but I wouldn't want to say use them without actually looking at the science. It's not something we use. Uh, we are still we're still manual uh, toe pressures. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Leanne. Um, and Kathleen is also asking, um, is it possible to complete a toe pressure without an ankle pressure or is this pointless? No, no, no. You can just do a toe pressure on its own. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, very, very useful, especially if patients, if you haven't got the big enough cuff to go around the leg or the leg is too tender, they don't want you to push on it or you've got a wound that you feel like you don't want to inflate over. And you can do a toe pressure in isolation. That's a reliable method of assessing peripheral arterial disease. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Leanne. Vicky, I hope you're ready. We've got a few quick fire questions on larval therapy. Brilliant. Um, so the first one from Lauren is, Does uh, sorry, do larvae leave tendons alone when they're debriding a wound? 
as long as they're healthy yes um which is why they're so great for for things like feet because like Liam was saying you know if you if you're really that worried that you're going to end up cutting something the the larvae just won't touch it um obviously if they are necrotic in any way then they might debride it um and that's a discussion you'd have as a team but to be fair you're going to want a necrotic tendon in a wound probably not so um yeah they'll they'll leave it well alone as long as, long as it's healthy yeah oh wonderful thanks vicky and renata's asking how would you convince a patient to try larval therapy oh that's a good question i mean to be fair like like leanne said you get to a stage with a lot of patients where actually do you know what they'll try anything they just want it sorted um a lot of the reasons patients are uh apprehensive let's say is because of things like you know there's obviously the yuck factor um patients associate maggots with things like bins and and dirty places uh, but our our maggots are the cleanest little maggots they're ever going to meet they go through um, a fairly stringent disinfection process um so you know that they're, they're not going to be introducing anything nasty with them the other worry is often that they are, you know, going to feel munching and crunching. But as we've said, they don't have teeth, so they can't bite or chew. And I think also it's very interesting, you know, what words you use. So be really careful about not saying munching and crunching and biting and chewing, because that can mislead people into thinking they're going to feel something nasty like that. Um, other worries are generally, you know, having the idea of having in creepy crawlies crawling over their wound, but we know they're in a bag. So, uh, you know, a lot of patients are pretty happy um, knowing that they're contained. Um, so, yeah, they're probably the, the main reasons. But obviously, if you are having problems or, or you're, um, you need some more answers uh, for, for patients' questions, we've got patient leaflets or you can contact us and we'll always happily, uh, you know, support with those conversations. Yeah, we've got some FAQs on our website as well from both a, a, a clinicians and a patient perspective. So do feel free to check those out as well after the webinar. Um, but another question for you, Vicky. So Stacey's asking, is it appropriate to use hydrogel to soften a scar um, for larval therapy? Um, prior to use, yes. Um, you, anything you want to use to, to soften eschar um, prior to love therapy, yes. Just obviously make sure that you take it off and um, really irrigate it off well before you put the larvae on because um, gels and things like that, they can block the larvae's breathing tubes and cause them to suffocate. So um, it's fine, fine to use and just really irrigate the wound well before applying. Great, thank you. And Robin is asking, can larvae be used if a patient's on antibiotics? Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I would say if you're using antibiotics because of the wound infection, but remember the larvae are antimicrobial. So you might not need the antibiotics if you're using larval therapy. So it's worth having those discussions of the team to see, you know, whether it's appropriate to be using both at the same time. Um, but yeah, absolutely fine to use together. Fab, thank you. And Sam is asking, um, are there any medications that um, they'd need to stop prior to a patient having larvae applied? Uh, systemically, no. Topically, uh, if you're using like topical uh, metronidazole and things like that, um, uh, met yeah, then, you know, you need to stop those things because they might suffocate the larvae and interact with them. But no, systemically, no, you shouldn't need to stop anything. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, and Carol's asking, what's uh, the recommended sort of process for disposing of um, used larvae bags? Uh, so they go into a yellow dressings bag, they tie a knot, and then it goes into your clinical waste. And then they, they go to heaven. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. Um, let me just double check. Bear with me. The questions are continuing to flow through. Thank you, everyone. Um, Anita is asking, how often should larval therapy be changed um, or turned um, and how long should they be allowed to stay on a wound? Um, so the therapy is four days with the day of application being day zero, um, 96 hours. If you want to work in hours, I prefer days. Um, you don't need to turn the bag. Um, I know back in back in the old days, we did used to turn the bags, but you don't need to do that anymore. Um, just leave them well alone. Uh, and yeah, so that's how long you should leave them for. Um, ideally, you take them off at 96 hours. If there is a delay of a little bit, it's fine. It's not going to be the end of the world, but that's that's when you should take them off. 
Oh, great. Thank you. Um, and Anna is asking, so in addition to larval therapy, what other debridement options um, can be preferred? Um, and I can put that to both of you, Leanne, feel free if you'd like to answer Leanne as well. American. Yes, so as we discussed, we've got the autolytic debridement, which is the majority of dressings that's out there um, across the UK. Um, they are slow in action. There is sharp and correct debridement, but again, as we've discussed, be careful of those underlying structures. There is a little bit of enzymatic debridement um, that's around, but mostly for burns rather than anything else in terms of how it's licensed in the UK at this moment. Um, and and there, there's a one chemical debridement, but again, it's only licensed for burns. It's not licensed for any other type of wound. So truthfully, you've got a choice of a, a blade, larvae, or um, um, autolytic debridement. Um, and with these type of patients that we're discussing, You've got to be the best of the game to use a blade. Autolytic debridement is going to be so, so slow. For me, you need to be considering the larval therapy. Okay, brilliant. Um, and Vicky, Karen is asking, so apart from a really dry, uh, hard necrosis, are there any other, co other contraindications for larval use? So there are a couple, yes. So if you've got a patient um, whose wound has a tendency to bleed and if it's got a major blood vessel involved, um, then you do need to be cautious, especially if you think that blood vessel is necrotic because obviously the larvae won't know that the necrosis is plugging up that wound, that, that vessel and stopping it from bleeding out. So you do need to be careful in those situations. Um, if you've got patients on things like heparin and warfarin and they're not within their therapeutic range, then you need to have a chat as a team decide whether that patient is um, a, a bleeding risk and again then consider other options but but with to be fair with those patients you can just wait until they're back within therapeutic range if you if you want to um, other things to bear in mind is if your patient's got really heavy pseudomonas so like the bright blue green wound that's really malodorous I'm sure we all know the one um, that can be poisonous to the larvae so it is worth just um, getting that under control before you put them on um, and also just be aware we don't have a lot of evidence if any to support the use of larvae against things like exposed organs um, in theory they won't do much as long as the organ is healthy but we haven't got the evidence to back it up so you know if you want to carry on your evidence-based practice then bear that in mind oh lovely thank you and asuncion is asking is it safe to use larval therapy if a patient is diabetic and what other dressings can be used if a wound has adherent slough um so um, absolutely safe in diabetes and I, and I think we've covered that already in terms of the, the autolytic stuff, there's loads of dressings out there that you can do it. There's the hydrogels, the hydrocolloids, the hydrofibers, and there's the enzymatic stuff, there's the gel stuff, and there's loads of debridements that's on. Off, off, uh, that, that's on. There's 850 wound care products that's promoted within the UK. All I'd go back to is all of those debride by autolysis. Naturally, autolysis is slow. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And from what I can see, that does look to be all of the questions for you both this evening. But I will say to anybody who's asked a question specifically regarding ordering, um, cost and anything on an individual case by case basis, um, do feel free to reach out to myself, Vicky and the team. Um, we would be able to happy, we would be happy to talk you through those individually. Um, if you would like to give us a call or email us, I will go through and pop the details on the screen for you very soon. But thank you everybody for um, all of your questions. Um, they were really great this evening and it's been um, wonderful, uh, you know, to answer all of those for you and a huge thank you to Leanne and Vicky for taking the time to go through them in such detail. Um, so this is it for the session this evening, but thank you everybody. It's been such a pleasure to have you here and you've all been so engaged and, you know, we can see you've all enjoyed the session. So it's been truly wonderful. Um, but some dates for you just for your diaries for Biomond live webinars that we've got coming up. So next week, myself and Vicky are hosting our level three webinar for prescription initiators. So please do feel free to register for that. We'd love you to join us. Um, and then on the 27th of October, we've got a very special webinar with uh, one of my colleagues, Micah Flores. Um, he's our R&D um, manager at Biomond, and he's going to be giving you a little inside sneak peek to Biomond and, and the flies and, and what we do in our facilities. So um, he's an entomologist by trade. So uh, it'll be very useful and, and informative for you I'm sure so please do sign up for that one 
And then Vicky is going to be presenting for you on the 17th of November with a special Stop the Pressure webinar, which I'm sure you're all going to be looking forward to. So again, yes, it'd be great if you could register for that as well. Now, if you've enjoyed this evening, um, we do have a number of other learning options for you here at Biomond. So we've got Biomond Now, which are our bite-sized video tutorials, um, which Vicky kindly creates for us. And they can be found via our YouTube channel. Um, we've then got Biomond Academy, which is our online learning platform. Um, it's a step by step um, sort of academy program. Um, that you can learn in your own time um, and that can be found via our website. And we've also got Biomond Direct, which is our team's training sessions, which again, Vicky kindly conducts for you. And you can book onto one of those sessions again via our website. And also, as I've said, so if anybody does have any further questions after this evening um, for either ourselves, myself and Vicky or Leanne as well, um, please do feel free to get those across to us. You can do so um, either by calling us, um, our helpline number is on the screen for you. Um, and also you can email us as well. So please do feel free to, to make a note now of both of those um, methods to get in touch with us. And as I said, we do have our website as well. And if you haven't checked it out recently, it's had a very fancy makeover. <laughs> so we've got lots of new resources on there for you. So it would please be great if you'd uh, have a little look at that. And um, we're also on social media. We're on basically every form of social media you can imagine. Um, so if you do like social media as much as we do, then please do join us there. Give us a like and a follow and a comment. And I will say it's not on my screen, but we do also have a TikTok account. <laughs> so if you'd like to follow us on there, please do. Um, we post lots of educational content as well as we do have a bit of a laugh as well. I will be honest with you but that is it from us this evening so a huge thank you Leanne you've been amazing this evening I've absolutely loved every minute of it and I hope that everybody watching at home has as well and thank you to Vicky as well for helping out with the questions on larval therapy and a huge thank you to everybody at home um, you've been phenomenal this evening and you've all been so engaged and I really hope you've enjoyed so thank you for joining us on Biomond Live and we will see you again very soon thank you everybody enjoy the rest of your evening